The views and opinions expressed by callers, guests, and hosts do not necessarily reflect those of the Black Talk Radio Network and Black Talk Media Project. Black Talk Radio is new black media for the new millennium. Broadcast of Black Talk Radio News. My name is Scotty Reed, and of course, as I always say, I'm broadcasting from behind the enemy lines of USA Inc. It is a Thursday night. I can't remember the last time I did a broadcast on Thursday night, but it is February the 28th in the year 2019, and we have a pre- a great topic as a current topic. Uh, Lots of people talking about it. I don't understand why they don't talk about it more. But we'll be doing some reparations talk. At least that's what a CNN analyst said. And I'm going to. I'm not even going to get into the details of how it's being trivialized uh, by this particular uh, CNN broadcaster. But there is a problem uh, with some people who look like me, share my skin color, but obviously we don't share the same idea ideology or the same ethics so i'm gonna be putting out a video but she called it reparations talk giving a another corporate media outlet the credit that everybody's talking about and i'm like wait a minute the last two presidential uh, elections uh we can go back to clint i mean when barack obama ran do you support reparations no moved on hillary clinton do you support reparations No, move. I mean, so the idea that this is some kind of new reparations talk in the Grio, no, who did they give credit to? The um, root, the root, another non black owned corporate media outlet with black employees. And I'm going to do a video on how they have just been disrespecting um, black people, but that's, you know, what they call it the reparations talk. And You know, it just boggles my mind why during the blue wave that they were promoting politically on TV, vote for Democrats, where was the reparations talk then? And so we can get deep off into this conversation and we will uh, do a series of shows. I've already done two programs uh, on this issue. And so I have to also... Uh, include myself in those uh, because I wasn't talking about reparations or bringing nobody on to talk about reparations during the midterm. So, you know, we always had to do self-reflection. But that, but others have been working on this issue for decades, for years, and we'll be talking um, to a representative of one of those such groups uh, when we speak with Mr. Leonard Walker, who is the president of the Descendants of American Slaves political action committee and so again i have to do some self-reflection um always correct my language because you know i will i've done other other um media uh put out some thoughts on why is it that quote unquote black people um cannot get legislation moved through the congress and signed by the president like you see other individual groups, whether you're talking about APAC, which represents Israeli Americans, along with white evangelicals and the defense uh, lobby. That's a powerful lobby. They got a lot of money, you know, and where's our lobbies and where are our super PACs? And we don't, I, I'm not going to bring on a super PAC tonight, but we are bringing on a PAC, a political action committee. And I've talked about, do we know 
how the political games are played. What does it take? Yeah, we can talk about getting big money out of politics, reversing Citizens United. But until that happens, then we already see what it takes to get legislation passed. In in to, to if you want to simplify it, it comes down to money. And we are disadvantaged as a group to collectively we don't have the American currency to invest in our political agenda. So, you know, we're going to have to act. We can't rely on those so-called token billionaires. It's not enough of them in the United States to, you know, but we can all collectively do our part. And so, you know, I'm seeing Mr. Walker and those uh, that he'll talk about tonight and this political action committee, which I didn't know existed, it, it, it definitely is a step in the right, right direction. You have to know how politics, They, I don't want to simplify it as civics 101 because they don't get those classes. That's not standard in every high school or elementary, uh, civic, how government works. And I think that a lot of the media that's produced for us does, don't really talk about how politics works. It's more like pop, pop culture type news bites and stuff like that. And so um, we're going to go over some items in the news. And of course, those items is going to be related because I want to paint a picture for you. You know, we're being played right now or those who are seriously inter interested in what they're calling reparations. And then we have to even define that and define who we're talking about getting any kind of quote-unquote policy or a bundle of policies and, and exemptions or, or whatever you're talking about to repair the victims, of the descendants of the victims of American slavery. But this political action committee is, is talking about some other stuff and not just talking about that slavery. It's, they're very unique from, I've had the conversation for a couple of days with Mr. Walker and, you know, he just... I've heard the arguments before, but he explained it to me in such a way that where it was logical and it made sense. So, I mean, we're not even asking the right questions. For example, one of the um, news items, we're going to go over three stories concerning reparations, but one of the news items was the Grio. The Grio asked Kamala Harris, and the question was, does Kamala Harris support reparations for black Americans? And so we saw the reaction to that on social media with the hashtags and, and all of that. And there, and then I was reading it today and, re, and probably reflecting on it or paying closer attention because of my conversations with Mr. Walker uh, in, in private. And so I was like, my radar was up. So what's wrong with this question? Does Kamala Harris support reparations for black Americans, because that can be anybody, because we're in the racist system, we didn't create it, and, you know, our research through New Abolitionist Radio, the introduction of race in the United States, or we should correctly say the colonies, the British colonies, um, the introduction of race did not enter into law until they made chattel slavery for African-descended people only. That's when they also passed the Black Codes that not only regulated uh, the movement of American slaves, but also regulated those who were free, who a lot of historians want to act like didn't exist. And there were colonists, free black people. And so this racist legislation that first introduced and that was uh, in Virginia, the colony. So this is even before the creation of the Republic of United States of America, where, you know, they started restricting the rights of, quote unquote, black people created the term, the, the uh, classification, free black people. Uh, stripped them of their Second Amendment rights and any other protections uh, that they had. And, and I don't want, that's a long list that I could go into. So what's wrong with this question is what I asked. So what's wrong with this question is, who are black Americans? Who are you talking about? And what's, is there a legal distinction? So that's what's wrong with that question, but we're getting these sound bites. And we're going to hear some of the sound bites, but this is, this is the path I want to put this uh, audience tonight. They tune in 
uh, for this program to just critically think about what, what you're hearing. We have to ask more questions. What is reparations? You know, Bernie Sanders was uh, had a town hall, and the question really um, didn't come from the audience, but it came from, well, I, I, I'm not so sure about that, but I know Wolf Blitzer. He tried, he tried to do some follow-up questions. And he asked him, do you support reparations? And then Bernie Sanders said, what's reparations? And a lot of people said, oh, he's, he's against reparations. But how do you define reparations? Okay. So if you don't have a definition, which that mean, that can mean many different things. Some people, it just mean a check. Other people, it may mean a set of policies. So that here's the wrong questions being asked. Do you support uh, reparation and then he said Elizabeth Warren, you know the uh, senator who's also running for president. Uh, Wolf Blitzer said, "Well, uh, Elizabeth Warren supports reparations." And he said, "Well, what policies <laughs> is she talking about?" And and then there was again the reaction, the non the non uh, critically thinking reaction, and and so you know we have to really really. Uh, focus on the words that's being used here, and more importantly, what they mean. What do these words mean in in a, a legal proceeding under the law? So we can get deep off into this conversation. Um, but what I'm going to do is paint that picture, and we got Mr. Walker on the line. Mr. Walker, pay attention to what's being said. Now, this is going to be an introduction uh, program uh, for this particular political action committee because I don't I, I want him to be able to give us a presentation about what he's his role in it, what he's been working on, what's their pathway, what's their what's their agenda. And um we wanna give him an opportunity to do that uninterrupted. So I'm not gonna take telephone calls uh during that portion of the program and going through the news what what i'll do is open up the phone lines after he goes so maybe the he, he gave me two hours tonight up till 10 o'clock p.m so at 9 30 we'll open up or sooner if, if if the flow of the conversation goes that way but we're going to go over the news and the picture that the mainstream media is painting and how they're framing it and and you know I want y'all to listen to this. So this one right here, Pelosi. This is the latest news. And let me also state this: I tried to find the most accurate headlines because a lot of headlines is also using words incorrectly and saying that these politicians are, for example, Julian Castro that's running for president. I think he out of Texas or California. I'm not sure because he's a twin, but um. Um, he said, a headline said that Julian Castro su uh, supports reparations. Now, when you re read the article, if you clicked on it, because, you know, I was on a smartphone or whatever, or, or I saw the headlines in the news feed. Some people just read headlines. So when I clicked on it and read the, the article, he doesn't support reparations, but he studies, he, he uh, uh, supports studying the issue of reparations, which is a bill that I think it was John Conyers, Senator John Conyers, has been introducing, and I don't want to exaggerate, so this is going to be a conservative est estimate, but he's filed H.R. 40 every year for the for the 10 years. Is Conyers still alive? Is he still in Congress? He might be retired. I'm not sure about that. But, so again, if you want to talk about giving somebody credit for talking reparations you had to get at to when some legislation uh mentioning the issue was introduced so that go to mr Conyers. they don't go go you know um go to uh anybody else that's causing it to be talked about in the news media but you know the news media don't always report these things and there's movements and things i've read about it concerning the black panther party which was a political party um that I don't, I would have never learned unless I searched for the information. So we got the latest headline. I try to find the most correct headlines. That doesn't mean uh, for those that's in Black Talk Radio Network's community, social media community, BTR community, where I posted my show notes. Uh, Pelosi says she supports Bill to study issue of reparations for slavery. See, that's a correct, that's an accurate statement. 
She's talking about what? H.R. 40. And she's probably known about H.R. 40 as long as she's been in there. We know she know about H.R. 40. How? Ha, why is she only talking about it now? And she ain't, is she really saying anything? You're not really saying it. So, okay, you support a bill. You ain't say in the next six months, I will bring H.R. Bill uh, 40. I will have enough votes. The Democrats control the House of Representatives. And we will pass this bill and... You can plan on it on Juneteenth if they want to throw some symbology in there. On Juneteenth, we will have this bill uh, advanced to the Senate, and then our our partners in the Senate will then, you know, come up with their version, reconcile it, sign it, pass it, put it on Trump's desk, and then it's on Trump's desk. It also will be a precedent set. So these people just saying they support something don't mean nothing. So Pelosi says she support the bill. That's accurate. But it doesn't mean anything. Um, this is an excerpt from The Hill. A uh, speaker, Democrat out of California, Nancy Pelosi, said Wednesday she supports a bill that would establish a commission to study and consider reparations for African Americans regarding slavery. The resolution, you know what I should do? I didn't want to open it up. Let me open it up so I can get her exact words in quotations. This is coming to you from The Hill. Uh, dot com. Okay, she says um, the resolution, which was reintroduced last year by Representative Sheila Lee, a Democrat out of Texas, currently has 35 co-sponsors, though Pelosi's backing could help lead to more widespread support among the House Democratic Caucus. As you probably are aware, Congress, this is her talking, as you probably are aware Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee has legislation to study this issue and I support that Pelosi said in a response to a question about reparations during an event at Howard University in Washington DC so she's at a, a, a so-called black HBCU which is you know really was a, um, a historically American slave college I mean if I'm adopt the terminology of, um, you know, our guest tonight. Uh, so I just, but uh, the Democratic leader tied studying represent reparations to a litany of other issues involving inequality, including, so she started talking about lift all boats policy, which doesn't mean I'm against those. I am certainly not against free Medicare for all. In fact, I wanted it expanded to cover prisoners who are in the prison plantation system, in the jail, in a prison, in a detention facility, whatever you want to call it. Uh, lots of people die in those places because of lack of health care that they privatize. So does that's a tangible that I can get down with as a new abolitionist concerned about the human rights of prisoners everywhere on the planet, but primarily here in the United States because slavery has never been abolished, and I see it that way. It's expressed through the prison and legally through the 13th Amendment. So those are the questions. So we're not talking about lift all boats. Doesn't mean that we against that, because of course, you know, free college tuition at state universities and colleges would, would what? Benefit who the most? And then it doesn't have to be a race to the bottom because we already there <laughs> economically, you know what I'm saying? And so uh, we will benefit from that generalized policy that doesn't discriminate against anyone by race. Everybody get to go to state colleges and universities that want a higher education. Uh, who could be against that? But they ain't got nothing to do with reparations, okay? Uh, So-called reparations, I, I should say. So really, you know, Pelosi isn't, this might be the first time she might have publicly expressed support for studying the issue and taking it under consideration, which is far from any kind of substantial uh, policies of being enacted specifically for a group of people, because we're not there that, and that's the purpose of bringing on uh, our guest tonight. Now, Kamala Harris, again, I, I, preview, I said this earlier, this is the wrong question. Does Kamala Harris support reparations for black Americans? The question should be, and, you know, again, uh, thanks to Mr. Walker, the question should be, does Kamala Harris support reparations for the descendants of American slaves? That's what the question should be. Because when I interviewed Ross and got his story 
as an American, really as an African American, but first born here on this soil from his family line because his mother and father both was from Tobago. So technically he's an African American and he's married to American descendant of slaves. But, you know, so he already said he knows he doesn't he doesn't fit into that unique category of people that need to be addressed. So the correct correct question would be. Would do you Kamala Harris, Senator Harris, let's be, you know, use her title, uh, Senator Harris, would you support reparations? Again, that's not even being specific, but let's just play along. Does Kamala Harris support reparations for the descendants of American slaves? Specifically, a lineage enslaved by Americans. All right, so this is what she had to say for those that didn't that missed it or missed some of my uh, earlier podcasts. I'm going to play this for you. It's only two minutes long. Do you support reparations for black people? Well, listen, again, we had over 200 years of slavery. We had Jim Crow for almost a, a, a century. We had legalized discrimination, segregation, and now we have... It, it, segregation and discrimination that is not legal but still exists and is a barrier to progress. We have disparities around housing. We have disparities around education. We have disparities around income. And we have to recognize that everybody did not start out on an equal footing in this country. And in particular, black people have not. And so we have got to recognize that and do something about that and give folks a lift up. That's why, for example, I'm proposing the LIFT Act. Give people who are making $100,000 or less as a family a tax credit, which will benefit and uplift 60% of black families who are in poverty. So by default, it affects black families, but there's not a particular policy for African Americans that you would explore. But no, if you look at the, the reality of who will benefit from certain policies when you take into account that they're not starting at, at, at the same place and they're not, stand, they're not starting on equal footing, it will directly benefit black children, black families, black homeowners because the disparities are so significant. So if we focus on the specific issues that have resulted in the greatest disparities and we understand that that's part of why we're doing it, listen, the, the reality also is this. Any policy that will benefit black people will benefit all of society. Let's be clear about that. Let's really be clear about that. So I'm not going to sit here and say, I'm going to do something that's only going to benefit black people. No, because whatever benefits that black family will benefit that community and society as a whole and the country. Right? So again, the question is not black Americans, but American descendants, uh, I mean, excuse me, descendants of American slaves, that lineage. Nobody else Yes, you practice racism and white supremacy against everyone who you who this system has classified as black. And also, I should point out, this is Black Talk Radio. Not ashamed of that name. I don't con- think uh, uh, see it in the context that I'm contributing to the problem. I'm not the government. Uh, I use it culturally. Um, people around the world, well, I shouldn't say around the world, but uh, uh, prominent people in Africa, uh, refer to themselves as black as a way of uniting, showing unity uh, in the face of glo- what they know to be global white supremacy and then some of our earlier uh, human rights activists like Malcolm X uh, making those connections over there as well as some other lesser alone uh, activists and, and people. So, you know, Kamala Harris, uh, we are not talking about black Americans. That could be anybody that's not a legal classification and you, you're a lawyer, and you might, you know, want to chime in on: Do you support uh, studying legis? Uh, excuse me, uh, putting something in the committee to study designating exactly who we're talking about that has been harmed in that specific way. If we're talking slavery, but of course, slavery's never been abolished. But that's a separate lawsuit or 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 issue. But it's still connected. So I'm not going to go on that tangent. Here's the other one. Julian Castro, reparations, a discussion worth having. That's hardball, MSNBC. Let's listen to what uh, uh, this presidential candidate for the Democratic nomination, Julian Castro, had to say. 
And the most recent poll I could find on it, I think it was about two or three years, uh, two or three years old. It showed two thirds of Americans opposed to that idea. Uh, there we put it up on the screen, 68% were against reparations payments. I wonder if you could just talk a little bit more about what it is you would do as president w when it came to that. And if, if you are worried that, that that sends a message to that 68% of Americans who say they're against it, that, that, that maybe you uh, are out of the mainstream a little. Well, you know, uh, this is not something that I think of through a political lens. Uh, it, it, I have long believed uh, that this country should resolve uh, its original sin of slavery, and that one of the ways we should consider doing that is through reparations for people who are the descendants of slaves. It is interesting to me that under our Constitution and otherwise, that we compensate people if we take their property. Shouldn't we compensate people if they were property sanctioned by the state? So I believe that that, that is a conversation that's worth having. And I see that as right and wrong. I don't see that as political or non-political. Um, so uh, if I'm president, what I said was that I would establish uh, a task force to look at how that might be done. I know that there's a lot of disagreement, both about whether it should be done and if it were done, how it would be done. You know, I'm not naive about that. But I do think that that dark cloud still hangs over our country. I believe that we ought to move forward in the 21st century as one nation with one destiny, and that until that issue is resolved, until that original sin is addressed, we may think that we're moving forward as one nation, and I don't think that we ever really will. Hey there, I'm Chris. Okay, we're going to leave it there. But again, some people headline this as Julian Castro supports reparations. He's for reparations. I'm going to use it against another candidate. How He said he's for reparations. How come you can't say it? And that's not what Mr. Castro said. Mr. Castro said that uh, he basically said in a nutshell, I support reparations. H.R. 40, what Nancy Pelosi said. Let's have a conversation. Let's study it. I'll create a task force. Um, and so there you have it. That is a far cry from, quote unquote, supporting reparations. Again, what is reparations? And now the media has this tendency to always play into the public's mind that we're talking about cash payments, dollar dollar bills, y'all, on some level like that. And, and that's the media. That's the media. And so that plays into 68% of people polled, because we ain't, they ain't polled everybody, but 68% of people polled say they don't support reparation payments. That's because the way the question has been framed to them. But would these people um, support if it was presented to them where they're not talking about all black people or all African Americans, but the, the polling question said, the descendants of American slaves and reparative policies. Would you support that? Ain't specific for them. With and then you had to put some bullet points on under there. So it's just how how much information you present to the voter on whether or not they gonna make a, have enough information to make an informed decision of whether or not they support re, so called support reparations. So now. I want to go into presentation mode, okay? I want to go into presentation mode, give you some background. Um, we're joined by Mr. Leonard Walker. He's a president, again, as I stated earlier, of Descendants of American Slaves Political Action Committee. Mr. Walker credits uh, the, the movement to Mr. Norris Shelton, whose research led him to introduce the concept of of American slaves and descendants of American slaves to America in his book, America's Little Black Book, which was published in 2005. If y'all listening on uh, TuneIn or YouTube or, or Blog Talk Radio, any of the other places that we distribute these podcasts when you're listening to it later, uh, come, come to blacktalkradionetwork.com. Uh, so you can see, you know, the graphics and get the links to where you need to go. Or maybe you're a good Googler and you can find it. The title again of his book is America's Little Black Book. And the author's name is Mr. Shores, uh, Norris Shelton. Now, Mr. Walker was introduced, our guest tonight, 
Mr. Leonard, who I've had the pleasure of having private conversations with over the past couple of days, but uh, he was introduced to this movement in 2014. That's the same year that, you know, I launched um, the movement New Abolitionist Radio focusing on the 13th Amendment, uh, the fact that slavery had never been abolished. But Mr. Walker said that based on his research and dealing with our people, and of course, you know, given the name, he when he say our people, because I hear a lot of people say our people, you know, as if there is some kind of consensus on this. Uh, but, you know, he is talking about the American uh, slaves, descendants of American slaves. So that's what I'm sure he means by our people. It was abundantly clear we needed to reshape our culture from the foundation up. In 2018, the 501c4 uh, DAS PAC, uh, DAS PAC was created for the specific purpose of getting our people actively involved properly with the political aspect of our community. Now, I want to bring him on so he can express that in a more personal way in his words, but we do have some topics. He has some people activity areas uh, for my Neely Fuller uh, fans out there that follow the work of uh, the counter-racist uh, lecturer, um, Mr. Neely Fuller Jr., um, you know, he came up with a list of people activity areas. I can't remember how many was on his list at this time. Might be 12, but uh, these can be classified as a couple of them are some of the same name, you know, uh, areas that he identified. But politics is a people activity area. Economics is a people activity area. Uh, Mr. Fuller doesn't talk about cultural, um, but injustice. Uh, he talks a lot about justice. Dismantle the color-coded caste system called race that denies our people the full rights and privileges of U.S. citizenship guaranteed by the U.S. Constitution. And, and so y'all can read the re rest of that. We'll probably read it in its entirety as we move through the uh, topics before we launch a uh, discussion on that. But without further delay, let me pull up my board and get Mr. Leonard Walker, um, the president Uh, a fellow Afro-Carolinian, and that term that I refer to myself sometimes means uh, African descendant, North Carolinian, um, but um, yeah, Mr. Walker, Descendants of American Slaves Political Action Committee, you know, I, um, again, kind of new to me, so I just want to make sure I, I get that correct, so uh, Mr. Shelton, oh, I'm, I'm not, I think this is you right here, um, do we do we have you on the line, sir? Mr. Yes, sir. Mr. Walker. Me? Yeah, Mr. Walker, Mr. Leonard Walker. Yes, I can hear you. Uh welcome to the broadcast okay. and hanging in there with me uh while I went through the news and just clarify some things, you know, especially what black means to me culturally and how I use that term in Black Talk Radio Network, um, to reconcile that why I can also get behind the term American slaves because I know what the intent is. But welcome to the broadcast. You know, we've been having conversations uh, uh, over the past couple of days, and, you know, you really got me to thinking about some things, and, and you know, I'm in full agreement, and I want to introduce uh, our, my audience, um, people for some reason uh, value my opinion and ask my opinion, and people's been asking my opinion about what I think about the ADOS hashtag, people using it, and that's being called a movement and what have you. And, you know, we've talked about that, but I don't want to, you know, I, if anything personal we talked about gets brought up, it's because you want that public. But, you know, welcome. And please introduce yourself, you know, 2014. As I said, you know, you, you was finding out uh, about this movement. Um, to identify the victims of American slaves, descendants of American slaves. And I would say, you know, and I think you agree, still being treated like slaves, still had that legal death. Um, so talk about a little bit about who recruited you. How did you, did you come across the Little Black Book? Uh, go ahead and give a welcoming uh, intro to the um, audience. Um, let me just say good evening, everyone. Um, it's, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here um, speaking with, with uh, you, Scotty, and your audience. Um, like I said, as, as I entered, I actually 
became a part of this in 2014. There's a one of my partners and business associates, uh, Mishawn Daniel. You know Mishawn Daniel. Um, I was hesitant and resistant at first. Um, I was part of the Black Consciousness Movement, so anything you know, I'm hearing with the word slave and American, and I, I wasn't having it. Okay, so so I, I can understand people's apprehension to all of that. Um, but what really got me is 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 my good friend Nishan Daniels. Okay, back then, you know, we both military guys, and irregardless of how you know we were. In op on opposite sides of the fence, I still had respect for him because he's my brother. All right, so I just I just saw how how just just bound and determined and just dogmatic about this movement he was, and I'm like, you know, for somebody to be just this entrenched into this, I, I maybe I need to you know open my mind and look and read and see what this is all about. So. Um, there was another another brother's name is um, 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 Dr. Gerald Higginbotham. He's the one who actually I got in contact with, um, who had been in contact with me, all right, and, you know, just kind of, you know, said, listen, get the book, get the book, America's Little Black Book, and, and, and you know, I'll show you, I'll, show, I'll, I'll give you the website in which you can get that. Get the book, read the book, and um, then just, you know, if you don't, Read the book and you don't, you don't feel it, then fine. So, you know, bought the book, all right, and wow, okay. I, I, I immediately began to understand and get what Mr. Shelton was talking about as far as us as a people uh, creating our own ethnic identity to um, link us to America and to the human family, okay. Slave, Negro, um, these, these, these are are terms that, that were dehumanizing terms. Um, we'll go into that when we talk more about reparations and, and that sort of thing. So, like I said, is, is, is you know, anybody that's out there, any, I'm, let me just say this, anyone that's talking about American descendants of slaves, descendants of American slaves, uh, American descendants of slavery, okay, there are some new groups that's out there, and they don't know about Mr. Noah Shelton, okay, you have to be wary. So Mr. Shelton, you know, spent a bit over a decade researching and and finding out and writing his book, and 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 you know, I think he started in the late '80s when he, uh, you know, came to the epiphany that you know, what what's going on? What's wrong um, with with you know? Why are we the way we are? And like I said, it, it was over a decade journey before he got his book out there and got it published. So. We have got to, he's an elder, he's, he's over 80 years old. Um, you have to give him, you know, credit. You've got to give, you've got to honor our elders and our ancestors, okay? And, God, you did a great job of introducing um, Mr. Shelton um, as far as, uh, you know, and then, like I said, it's, it's putting up the American slave flag, okay? So, like I said, is um. There are three organizations, um, and we all kind of work in conjunction with each other. There's a 501c3, which uh, the president is, is Mr. Norris Shelton, um, called American Slaves Incorporated, okay? Um, I'll get you more information about that. That's where you can get his book from. We have a for-profit corporation, a for-profit corporation, called Descendants of American Slaves Incorporated. This is where we sell products, um, and we are going to enter the economic battlefield through a corporation. Why do a, a for-profit corporation versus a non-profit corporation? Well, a for-profit corporation makes far more money than a non-profit unless you're the NFL or the NBA or the, or the, or the uh, NCAA, which is that's another form of slavery that we'll have to talk about another time. But like I said, it's um, for-profit corporations make more money than non-profit corporations, all right? Plus, as a people, we have got to become incorporated and get involved in the economic scheme of America, all right? So you have that one, and then um, I am the president of that one as well, of, 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 of what we call DASI, Descendants of American Slaves um, Incorporated. 
and we formed um, a political action committee because we, you know, is is we understood the the the, the value of voting. Okay, and over this period of time, I, I just studying our people and looking at you know this voting process and looking at how the you know right now you got people gerrymandering districts. Uh, Scott, as you know, North Carolina is infamous for gerrymandering districts, um, having voting machines not working within precinct, uh, cutting the polls off early, uh, you know, disqualifying people. Uh, recently, North Carolina voted on the voter ID um, uh, controversy, the voter ID, where you have to have an ident identification in order to be able to vote a special ID. Um, there was a judge that just struck that down and said it was unconstitutional. So we wiped the voter ID thing off. But we still have to uh, get together and um, vote. So the organization that is um, that I'm also the president of, that, I, that my main focus right now is going to be on, is uh, the Senate of American Slaves Political Action Committee. Um, what what I have through my research and studies, what I've come to understand is, is we're voting incorrectly. Um, voting incorrectly how? Number one, I'll give you a good example, is President Trump met, I'm, I remember, I'm pretty sure you guys remember when Trump was, uh, President Trump was um, running for office and he met with those 100 black pastors, okay? Um, you know, he met with the pastors, um, and I don't begrudge. I don't, you know, if you any polit any presidential or political candidate that you know you want your voice to be heard, or you want to find out, you know, which way you want to vote, or you know, or how is that going to benefit you? I don't begrudge anybody with meeting with anybody running for office. Okay, so he met with 100 black pastors. Okay, the 100 black pastors. We have that one pastor from Cleveland, the infamous um, one that told those lies about meeting. Some gangsters in Chicago. He was among some of those pastors, but um, and what they did is, I guess you know, they went around and introduced themselves. And the first thing they did was let, at that time, candidate Trump start talking, okay, about what his values were and these sort of things. And the thing that they asked for, hundred black pastors, thing that they asked for is, Mister Mister, if you become the president, are you going to protect? All right, as Christian. Okay, now I'm I'm pretty sure I have Christians. You know, you have Christians on the phone. And don't get me wrong. Is 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 I have nothing against Christians. Okay. However, the U.S. Constitution already protects the rights of Christians. Okay. What rights are we talking about? Okay, as Christians, um, these hundred black pastors. Okay, are we talking about how the Christian Church has been fleecing? The community for decades now, where you don't see any positive growth within the money that is being invested into the church, you don't see anything re reciprocated out into the community. Is that what we're talking about protecting? So, like I said, I, I, you know, I started to learn, but you know what? We need to learn and understand how to vote. So, maybe how that meeting should have went was, Mister candidate elect or candidate, you know, Mr. Candidate, presidential candidate. We are so and so, so and so, and these are our concerns in America. Concern A, concern B, concern C, and concern D. I don't care about the platform. What I want to know is what are you going to do for us specifically to address these specific issues that we have concerns your, li your list of demands. But yeah, list of demands. All right, is I, and I don't want I don't want you to give me promises. I want to hear strategy and plan, okay, on how you plan on handling this right here. And oh, and by the way, Mr. President, we're going to have the same meeting with your opponent, uh, Mrs. Clinton. All right, and ask her the same thing because whichever one of you, all right, whichever one of you can come up with a better strategy. Is who we will vote for, and believe me when I tell you, we have many, 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 many voters all waiting to vote one way or another, and we will donate right. our campaign donations 
to that particular candidate as well. If, so, if I may interject, Mr. Walker, real quick, because I want to stress the importance of what you're talking about, because this was one of my criticisms of us as a collective um, and not knowing how politics work, not organized on that level, not understanding how that people activity work. Yeah, we'll criticize, um, you know, APAC, we'll call them out, we'll call out Big Farmer, we'll call out uh, the military industrial lobby, the private prison uh, lobby, and but we and we all down, you know, if you're progressive, then you're down for uh, overturning Citizens United. But that's a long fight that ain't happened yet. That take money. They got the money. Um, where are our super PACs? Where, uh, where is the people that's putting this list of demands and having them come down to my head, our headquarters, like they go down to these different headquarters, uh, come to luncheons and stuff, and uh, talk about this list of demands, you know? And, you know, I can go to YouTube right now and pull up video of candidate after candidate after candidate with exception of few who every year go to APAC. APAC has been painted as the, a Jewish lobby. Then when you criticize them, then it's like, oh, you're being anti-Semitic. Now, I don't want to get into the yeah. semantics of that and whether or not people who speak Yiddish can accurately be called, from Europe, accurately be called uh, Semites because that's not a Semitic language. But this, APAC is more than just some right-wing politically uh, people who are Ashkenazi Jews, they white. That means they white. We're not talk we don't care about the religion. Because who else is donating heavily to APAC is those white evangelicals and probably those one hundred black Christian pastors. Who knows? They might you know, we had to follow the money too, you know. Um because someone sent me a link to some what I felt like was xenophobic platform from these black Republicans. And when I tried to follow the money, I followed it to a right wing GOP think tank run by uh, white people. You know, so we had we, we had to follow the money. So what you're talking about right now, specifically what we're getting into tonight, you mentioned the other organizations, but I my interest is most in the 501c4, the political action committee so now when you that's when you get to have the meetings with presidential candidates that you've been talking about so please continue i just wanted to give context okay all right thank you thank you um so what we what we what our plan is is it's really simple okay is is what we have to do is simplify it for our people um the democratic party has taken advantage of our vote all right, because we vote, I mean, we vote Democrat like nobody's business, all right? So, and when you do that and a party knows that you're going to vote for them because they feel like, okay, well, you're not going to vote for the other guys because you're painting a racist picture of them and you won't vote for that. So you'll vote for us or you just won't vote at all, okay? That's still to our advantage, okay? So... Instead of doing that, what we have to do is create an independent voting block, okay, an independent voting block that is not voting down party lines. Not We're not going to vote uh, uh, partisan politics anymore, okay? What we're going to do is, is, and it starts really within your local community because the reason why I say that is on the national level, because I pointed this out earlier, like we focus on the president on a national level, okay? Now, the president, no doubt, is important, okay? But at 13% population and because of, you know, mass incarceration and the neo-slavery, as, as Scotty would say, um, our voting numbers are probably worse than that. You're probably looking at maybe 10%, 9% as far as the voting population. Younger people typically don't start voting, um, 18 to 30 year olds don't really, you know, you get lower numbers of those people voting. Um, so yeah, you know, so we, we, we may not have 10% when you talk about a national voting population. Okay. And then now 10% is not bad if the nation is split and you represent the swing vote. The problem is that you have the electoral college that disperses our votes nationally. And so we can't really operate as a swing vote in that sense. 
we'd have to operate as a swing vote in New York or in Texas or California is going to be very difficult because we probably there's about five to eight percent population now. Quick, number, quick question: uh, uh, Our population percentage is down. Mr. Walker, quick question yes, though. Sir. You know, because this kind of ties into the movement work that I support and I'm involved with, this intersects with that. Um, but there is going to be an increase uh, in that voting base because the majority yeah. of the prisoners, whether they're federal or state, that's where it, most prisoners are in the United States or from the individual states, are uh, yeah. the descendants of American slaves. So with these yeah. movements and, you know, to restore the the uh, voting rights, and I say the full citizenship of the of these people yeah. being released from prison, uh, Florida, they're getting their rights back, a couple of other states, and it's important to keep pushing to have those. Because uh, yeah. um, that, that, if you can't vote, that what citizenship do you have? You know, that really went You don't have any. Okay. So, don't have any. so please continue. Please continue. Okay, so so like I said, it's, 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 and, and Scotty's right, there are states right now that are working to restore the voting rights and the citizenship of, of, of former uh, convicted felons. Um, and that's, that's critical and important because it goes back to why should a person be punished for the rest of their lives for something that a lot of, in, in many cases, as we're seeing, we've got our people that have been in jail for 20-something, 30-something years, 40 years, people that have went to jail in their teens or 20s, getting out of prison in their late 60s, almost 70s, okay, because now they found out that these people were innocent, all right? So you, you just wasted a, 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 a life right there. So these are all votable issues, all right? So creating this voting block, this works really well locally, because typically where we live, all right, we, we are, our um, population is usually somewhere between 15 to 35 to 40%. Okay, so now you can leverage that voting power, all right, with higher percentages. No, you're not. A lot of people say, well, wait a minute, we ain't the ma majority. We're the ma no, no, we're not a minority. Okay, what we are is a swing. Okay, so if you are... If, if, if your group of people represent or, you know, anybody who's a part of your pack represents 40 or, or, or 35, 40 percent, okay, there's not a politician out there, okay, that's not going to come and see you, especially knowing that those who are not in the pack, let's just say, you know, the, 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 the um, dominant white society, okay, typically their votes are split, all right? You have more white women voting Democrat, more white men voting Republican. So there's a split that's there, all right? So now you have politicians that say, oh, wait a minute. This group of people right here is up for grab. Well, you know, let's say you live in, you know, small town USA, 250,000 people, all right? And you got 50, 60,000 votes that are up for grab, Okay. There's not a politician, okay, that's going to ignore, all right, these people, all right? So that's the strategy right there. I mean, the whole thing is politicians want to win the election, okay? So in order to win the election, you're going to have to woo this group of people. And the thing is, is it's, it's the leverage you use is not so much that they want to win. They don't want to lose, all right? If they, you know, if you get a politician say, well, I'm not going to talk to these people because they historically don't vote. They don't do this. They don't do that. Wait a minute. My opponent is talking tomorrow. They're not going to show up to the polls. And then we show up to the polls as a voting block, and we get the things that we want to get. All right? The next time an election comes around, all of a sudden, oh, wow, this is a serious voting block here. These people caused this election to be this way because they showed up. One of our problems as a people is, like I said, we focus nationally, all right? So voting, let, you're just going to be honest, voting is a numbers game, okay? It's about percentages, numbers, how many people, all right? Especially on a local level where you don't have an electoral college, okay? You know, now, what, they, what they've done is they've split districts up and tried to split our community up where, you know, some will be here, some will be there. This is why it's important to vote locally because 
the people that make those decisions, you have House representatives and House senators within the state will draw these, you know, district lines, gerrymander these district lines, and take them to a judge, and the judge will sign off on them. When the judge signs off on them, guess what? This is what the district is now. And you belong to this district, but across the street, you know, is some other district, all right? But yet and still, this whole entire community is people that look like us, all right? So, right. like I said, that's why it's important to vote for these judges. It's important to vote for, you know, city council people. All Dis- the district attorneys, the district attorneys district are, are our last... Um, podcast uh we had a national uh researcher on who actually uh works politically on the inside to help da's uh get elected and whatnot he shared his thoughts with us uh the other night it's in our podcast archives but listen i don't mean to interrupt you but we at the top of the hour we got to take a break uh want to let you know you got about uh 28 minutes to get through the other topics because we can delve deep it's so many, you know, different bullet points under the um, demands that we could go for hours. But we will be having you back. We're going to do a series with you and uh, just keep it people. Because what you're talking about now, though, when you're talking about locally, we don't have that political organization. What you're talking about in voting as a voting block don't mean, you know, we really are not voting as a voting block. We really are. People are telling us how we're voting, but that's not an organized vote. Uh, only in the context of that Democratic uh, uh, outreach program for that campaign. We're not voting as as a voting block, if you want to talk, use the terminology, the black vote. And so what that takes is, then again, chapters, which I want you to talk about, Mr. Walker, you know, establishing for the political action committee individual chapters. Use the model of the NAACP out there, you know, to simplify it in your mind, people out there. But this is a political action committee. They put out newsletters. They do research. And then they tell, again, I'm going to bring up APAC because they the most powerful lobby out there. They send out newsletters. They do fundraising like they try to do off of what well, they did off of Representative Omar when she called out their undue influence in uh, the uh, American political system. And they sent out a fundraising letter on that. So they raised funds. They had these candidates meet with them. And then they give their voting block. That means the subscribers, the members, the contributors which you propose to me, $60 a year, they don't take nothing. Hey, I got $60. I'll be, I'll contribute that. That's the least I'll contribute in a year. May do more in addition to my time to organize us on the local level and what is a chapter but tied to a state and then that's tied nationally. We had to build our own institutions and that's what Mr. Walker's talking about. Um, institution building. So you're listening to Black Talk Radio News. We'll be back after this short break. Stay tuned. supremacy is a system and what does white supremacy really mean it just doesn't mean somebody being in charge no one should care about who's in charge of anything if the person is not mistreating people white supremacy is about mistreating people based on what based on the color in the skin of those people who are being mistreated that's all it is it's a form of mistreatment there are all kinds of mistreatment in the world, but that's the greatest form of mistreatment. That's why it's supreme, because it's the greatest form of mistreatment. If you want to look for mistreatment of the people anywhere on the planet, most people are being mistreated based on color. That's what it is. 
Mm. You know, if it's just two people on earth, I mean, one person might mistreat another person just because the person is jealous or mm-hmm. envious or something. Yeah. All kinds of ways to mistreat people for all kinds of reasons. But this business about racism is about mistreating people based on his color. Yeah. Make Black Talk Radio your choice for digital black radio. New black media for the new millennium. And welcome back to Black Talk Radio News. Scotty Reed sitting in behind this mic from behind the enemy lines of USA Inc. But tonight I'm joined by Mr. Leonard Walker, president of Descendants of American Slaves Political Action Committee, um, as well as some other and we and he talked about also you talked about Mr. Walker economics. So let's move to economics because I want to at least give us time uh, the last thirty minutes if we have any callers out there uh, in questions. So basically, what we've talked about the last fifteen minutes is the political end. That's the that's the, uh, the political action committee, political organizing. Let's talk about the economics. Okay, um, the economics plan. Um, one of the things about our people, um, we are woefully um, underdeveloped when it comes to um, economics and economic strategies and, and economic culture. Um, you know, you've got you know different different people within you know our our our, our uh, people have 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 you know have different uh, vehicles. Um, you got you know Boyce Watkins and Dr. Carl Anderson. You got many economists. Um, the thing is that what we want to try to do is we want to try to get at the basic level. We are our organization is a grant as a grassroots organization. All right, we we're among the people. We're not talking above anybody's head. We want to help those. All right, just at the basic bottom, you know, the little thing. Um, I can't tell you about investment strategies and 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 you know creating this and all of that kind of stuff if you can't even maintain a savings account or you don't have a bank account for you. Like I said, as you getting paid, taking your checks to the green store and buying stuff at a convenience store and then cashing your check there and putting the money up under the mattress, all right? You're not building wealth that way. And so we have to teach our people economically from the very foundation, all right? What What is money for? What is credit for, all right? Um, what are some good habits to get into? Um, Cost versus value. All right. You hear people talk about, yeah, man. I, I was, I think I was somewhere, and these these people were talking about some, yeah, man. These, yeah, yeah, those new Jordans or those new this or who who is the who is the, the basketball player, the uh, Var Ball, son, um, um, uh, Alonzo Ball. You know, go out and go to China. You know, make a shoe that probably costs about fourteen, fifteen dollars. Bring it back over here and sell them for five hundred dollars, four hundred, four ninety nine, ninety nine. Okay, um, Michael Jordan, Jordans, you know, two, three, you know, four hundred dollar pair of shoes. Uh, who was it? Kanye West, um, eight hundred dollar pair of shoes, and it, it's cost versus value. These shoes cost eight hundred dollars, but as soon as you wear them one time, they will devalue quicker than. Anything you could possibly ever buy, all right? Uh, you know, a car. I mean, it's their shoes. That's that's it, <laughs> right? So, so you know, these are things you know that that have us captured, all right? That, that we don't understand. So you know, you know, everything is about you know style and fashion and all that. But you know, you broke, okay? Or you you don't have a, a bank account, or you know, you driving a Lexus but living in the projects, okay? And 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 you don't you know understand how money works. So yeah, we have to well, part of that problem though. I'm I'm sorry, Mr. Walker, but part of that problem um, comes from the, what we'll talk about later. But this manufactured culture through media, and yeah. you know, so yeah. what you just described, you know, the eight hundred. They have shoes out there cost eight hundred. Wow, I didn't know that. But you know the the Gators, marketing. Not not no not no Gators. Gators is like you can get Gators are like what twelve to twenty five hundred dollars for some alligator shoes. These are gym shoes that cost eight hundred dollars. 
So eight hundred, eight hundred dollars. And where how is that being marketed? It's marketed to our people. It's marketed to them through pop culture, through music, through the radio station, through slick. They spend billions of dollars every year on how to sell you something. So you know we got a show, Tando Radio Show. They talk about those issues. Dave will be back tomorrow morning. Uh, which is Financial Friday on, on Tando Radio Show here on the Black Talk Radio Network. So, though, you know, that's marketed to us. And so we have to, you know, re, have to be cognizant and educate people on, you know, you're being sold on something. You're being sold on consumerism. Consumerism. That's just like uh, Dr. Claude Anderson said, is, is, is one of the things I agree with is he talks about spending power, buying power. There is no power in spending or buying or consuming, okay? People say, well, wait a minute, you know, we boycott and we do this or do that. Okay, so you're going to boycott McDonald's to give your money to Burger King. <laughs> you, still, you still don't have no money. You're still not producing your own burgers or have your own restaurant. So there is no power in consumption. The power comes in production. That is where you grow your wealth. So th- these are things, you know, community building, um, you know, this, this this is how you grow you. This is how we become wealthy. All right, it's, it's understanding the first step. And see, we're so far behind that it's just going to take, you know, just little little gradual steps. All right, little gradual steps. Say, hey, listen, because you have people that don't file taxes. Like I said, that don't have uh, a, a, a bank account, a savings account. All right, or you know, or operate with a bank. Um, People that can't save any money, that lives literally check to check, year after year. All it takes is one thing to happen, and you know now, you know they're trying to beg, borrow, and steal. You have people that do things like, I'm gonna loan this person some money, okay, out of money that I need, like my light bill. My light bill is due next week, and I'm gonna loan these people money out of my light bill because I never know when I might need a loan myself. That's a plan to fail. Okay, that's what that is. So it's it's a culture of of doing these types of things. All right, that we've got to change and and get on the track of where you know. Hey, how how can I utilize? You know, I don't have a lot of money, but I can utilize my money the best way I can. Okay, and start to get more money. We want where we yeah, ultimately le- want to get is where leverage. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. We want to let you. Ultimately, where we want to get is where we want to at least, you know, be. We want to be have our money making money. Okay, using our money to make money, have multiple streams of income. That's not not everybody's going to be that way. But here's the beauty about America. America, unlike most places in the world, even in Europe. Okay, the beauty of America is you have a middle class. Okay. The middle class is people who are not poor and destitute, but not necessarily rich, all right, but make enough to where, hey, you know what? I'm able to pay my bills. I'm able to live life comfortably. I can go on vacation. I've got some investment. I've got some retired. I have a, 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 a little bit of financial security. No, I can't afford a mansion and a yacht, but I've got a home. I've, you know, I've got money that I, you know, for my children for college. i got things saved up. You know, I got some savings. So that, that middle class, and this is a class that we're locked out of, all right, economically. Many of us, far too many of us, are in that working poor or government-dependent um, class, okay? That ties directly into one of the other things, our culture, building the family, okay? Um, right now, and, and I'll go into this, is, this is an African tradition that, that, that we use is um, – in, in African tradition, um, the family has value, okay, because the family is a wealth-building institution. It's the first and oldest wealth-building institution. So if 29% of us only get married out of 100%, less than 30, less, less than 30% of all, quote, unquote, black folks who get married, all right, 73% of all children are born out of, of our children are born out of wedlock. 67% are raised by single mothers, okay? That number is actually a skewed number because that's only single mothers. That doesn't include single grandmothers. So we're probably closer to like, and that's what you have now, the growing trend of grandparents 
and especially grandmothers raising their daughters and sons' children, okay? So now you're looking at a situation where it's more closer to 70% of black households, all right, are single parent, single mother household, single female. Now, why is it important with single female? It is, it is a historic fact that women, I don't care how many degrees this is get and all this, women make less money than men, all right? They make about, um, I say about 80%. 80 cents on a dollar is what a woman makes compared to a man, all right? So you are put, you're in a situation where we, are, we have a, the head of household, one person already in a household, and that person makes, less, makes the least amount of money in America trying to raise children, all right? So you just, you're in poverty. Matter of fact, you're in poverty to where you become oh, government dependent. Mr. No, Walker. It's almost impossible. Mr. Walker, the journalist in me has to has to interject and disagree with you on the point. It's only because I did the research, and this is something okay. my audience knows I have covered. But there is a myth of the absent black father, and I'm actually the living embodiment of that. I gained uh, sole custody of two daughters. I have three, but gained sole custody of my first two daughters from my marriage um, since they were mm-hmm. like in third grade. So, and I met, came into contact okay. with other uh, single fathers of, of different classifications, but, you know, also uh, some that look like, like me. There have been more recent updated uh, census and studies done by universities that these, when we say single ho- household or single mother or single parent, when we're discussing it in the context of tax return, that's true. Who's filing the tax yeah. return? Who has the job? Uh, uh, who's, who's, you know, so you can't, that's just because that woman's single, she is single from the aspect of marriage. And mm-hmm. so where I do, uh, so that absent father is not really absent and he, he's just not listed as living in that household. Or they may not be together in a relationship, but he's still contributing to his child and in that child's yeah, life. You, you know, yeah, so, I agree. You've got, now, yeah, you've got a lot of brothers. Matter of fact, i got three cousins who were single dads. It, 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 right, it right. Multiple right, but, <laughs> but, so but I'm not trying to make it. I'm just doing that as a point of clarification on the data because that's yeah. a, a myth that's, that's been circulated for a long time in the media, but I do agree with where you're going and what your main point is, is that there are economic v- advantages to marriage. So please continue. Yeah. Yes, sir. So, so like I said, it's, um, um, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, when you, a single household, all right, mother, father, or when you have to split, like I said, is even when fathers contribute, they still have to, if they're out of the household, they're not contributing all of their income to that household, okay? They've got to maintain the standard of living for themselves. So that cuts the money, all right, for those that contribute to their children's uh, health and well-being uh, monetarily. So being married, all right, keeping all of the money at home, all right, into the house, uh, you know, both parents, you know, working or one parent working, the other parent, you know, doing things to save money. All right, that's another thing. We look at, you know, how much we make, but we never think about how much we keep, all right? You know, how, you know that cutting expenses. Um, yeah, okay, that mother does not work, but if this father makes enough money and she runs the household, she can run that household, all right, and save money. So dad's money can act like two people's income, all right, with one person, and he's still there to be there with his children. Those children are looking at mom and dad, all right, sit down and do a budget, and they're talking about finances, and they just all of this kind of stuff is passed on from generation to generation. When one parent is constantly struggling, then it, you end up having a mentality of struggle. Well, that's just the way it's supposed to be. You know, my, 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 my cable bill ain't due until I get that pink notice that they get ready to cut it off. See, you, now you're destroying your credit. So it's, it's all types of things that we have to offer economically um, to be able to, to help our people at, at a grassroots, basic foundation level, which when I'm going to get back to what we're going to get back to, 
is one of the reasons why, you know, when you talk about reparation, um, we get this, oh, somebody's going to cut us a check. Oh, we're getting ready to hit the lottery type, you know, mentality, you know, when it comes to that. So, like I said, is we plan on having through our through a C3 that we're going to develop, having these basic types of skill, you know, mm-hmm. training for our young men and young ladies. You know, okay, um, what we want to do. We're going to try to do out that. Mr. Walker, I'm sorry. I would be remiss if I didn't mention and ask people to tune in um, tomorrow night. But I'm gonna give out the phone numbers because um, we time is uh, running short, and so I said I first wanted to let Mr. Walker speak. And but I am open to taking phone calls right now. If you have any questions or comments, 704-802-5056, 704-802-5056. Fifty fifty six. Hit the star key twice if you want to comment. If you're on by chance um, on our other line and you know the codes and and just do what you need to do um, to let me know. Um, but let me do this. Let me do this. Um, you had just brought something up. What was the last thing you brought up? We do have a caller, but what was the last thing you brought up? Um, about creating foundations and organizations to help our people understand it's financially literate. Right. Okay. Financially I literate. know. I, thanks yeah. for reminding me. I'm trying to promo tomorrow night's show. I mentioned Dave, David Wren. He's also a business sponsor of Black Talk Media Project. And we are going to launch a, a program for business sponsors where you're a business, which we can also geo target by uh, location. If you only want people to see your ads in South Carolina, cause you got a plumbing business and there's no need of people seeing the promotion for your business as a sponsor of the black talk radio network. Just stay tuned. Um, that information be showing up on the web on the website but they will be with us tomorrow night to talk about the financial aspect because he talks about what's currency and what's money some people call that american dollar money is not money gold and silver platinum palladium that's money uh, uh natural minerals the american dollar is currency printed by the federal reserve that only has value because in my opinion and my research shows because of uh, the barrel of the gun and forcing other countries taking control of their resources, mostly uh, oil, uh, and making them trade in that oil (laughs) using American dollars. So, so we have, they will do a show tomorrow night and cash is an asset, but you should, if you was to get a check, what would you do with that check? So tune, tune in tomorrow night for my show with David Wren, uh, 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. Let's go to the telephone call, area code 502. Uh, thank you for calling in to BTR News. You have a question for uh, Mr. Walker. Hey, what's up? This is uh, me, Sean, from Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, good hey, good up, evening. Man? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I just, I right. just walked in the house, man. What's What's up, Scotty? It's good. It's good to have you uh, having my brother on the on the on the show, man. I appreciate it, bro. Oh, uh, it, it, no doubt. You know what I'm saying. Um, I had a special connection with Mr. Walker. I shouldn't say special, but he comes from the background that I come from, a Afrocentricity and and what have you. Because he talked about it earlier, how we're resistant to certain labels like slave and and all this and that. But when you're talking legal strategy, when you're talking about, you know, filing lawsuits and then there's all this confusion, you know, well, who who does Nancy Pelosi consider to be a black American? And is that who we're talking about when we're talking reparations? So um, he's definitely got me on board, me, Sean. But what's on your mind tonight? Well, the only thing I wanted to uh, chime in, I, I had no intention because I need to get on home and take a rest. I didn't even talk to my wife yet. I just wanted to uh, say to you that Steve Harvey, uh, I just looked at the thing with Steve Harvey given his callback or given his response to all the people that called him a coon. And, you know, they mislabeled him. They, they, they really they really dogged him all through the media and everything. Uh, he just gave out a very, you need to take a look. He just acknowledged that the very things that you and I talk about, Leonard, the importance that learning how to get to the table and be heard, okay, and making sure that people understand 
what you about and everything. Steve Harvey, and I don't want to spoil it for nobody, everybody needs to see the response from Steve Harvey to all the naysayers, the fickle people, our people. Well, well uh, um, called him out me, Sean, I'm aware of the story, but he did correct himself. He said he misspoke. Because when, yeah. you know, in the contest, he was talking to Monique and why she can't seem to get uh, I'm not talking steady about work. Monique. No, I'm talking about, but no, no. that's that's where the controversy erupted from. He had a conversation with Monique about negotiating in Hollywood and how you get paid in the entertainment industry. And he misspoke. He says he misspoke when he said that, you know, there's no such thing as integrity. It's about getting that money. That's what he called called them out and then they circulated an old comedy routine now this is during his stand up routine when he was like uh, you know people get offended when they call us monkeys but I'll be your monkey for four million dollars I'll be scratching my booty and all of that and so when that response Steve did correct the record and come back and say integrity is important and that he was just stressing uh, like, like we've been stressing tonight if you're talking about the political game, which that's the only way reparations is going to come about, how do you get a seat at the table? So so I hear you on him uh, saying this is how I got a seat at the table and how we can apply that in different areas. Yeah, well, I, I was specifically talking about when he met with uh, President Trump and the, the backlash that he received. That's what he specifically, that's what I just saw. I just saw it. Just they now. bringing that back they, up? He, they specifically this this backlash was him responding to that he's at some type of meeting and he said man he's been waiting to give back a response and that's mm -hmm. the one that I'm talking about I'm talking yeah about I ain't got a problem with about. anybody meeting with the president as Leonard yeah, said earlier right, right. yeah yeah and Leonard I all I want to say man thank you for being representing man I think we need to do more of this uh, I didn't get to hear all of what you spoke about there but there is a difference between ADOS and ADS and uh, I will just say y'all know that you've already done it is that Miss Noah Shelton we honor our elders okay it's important that we honor our elders and moving forward that because that's the that's the glue that started our foundation to disrespect those who started something is wrong and that's one of the biggest things I have a problem with the movement uh, with the ADOS uh, movement versus uh, uh, hashtag uh, ADS or Descendants of Murray Slaves or Darcy Pack. So uh, that's all I want to add. Thank you, me, Sean. And the, the podcast will Thank be you. available tomorrow. You can check it out in the morning or the afternoon. Just go to blacktalkradionetwork.com. Okay, Mr. Walker, you want it uh, to continue. Okay, yes. Um, so as, as we talk in economics, let's, let's get into this reparations stuff. Um, first and foremost, what the, the reparations, all right, the first thing we have to say is who is reparations for? Just like you said. Reparations, all right, and what are reparations and who owes reparations and that sort of thing. And what, what is reparations? Reparations, number one, what's getting lost in this entire conversation about reparations is justice. Because that's what it's really about, all right? Is the injustice that happened to our ancestors through slavery and Jim Crow segregation. That that is what it has to be. Is people, you know, thinking, oh man, I'm about to get paid, you know, I'm about to get this check. All right. You know, that's you know, that's not what this is about. This is about justice because justice by definition is to correct a wrong or to make someone whole who was damaged, okay, by a transgression from another person or another another group or an institution or whatever. We have not been made whole, okay? So we talk about reparations. We talk about justice. Who deserves justice? Justice is deserved by, the uh, first, the American slave, all right, those who were denied the ability to make money, the ability to ha get educated, um, they were denied humanity, okay, because they were classified as property, and they were denied the um, protection under the law, all right, those four things. So, so those are the first people to deserve justice. The second people to deserve justice are the descendants of American slaves that suffered through 
Jim Crow segregation, the ones who were lynched, the ones who were given syphilis, um, the ones who were experimented on, um, the ones who had to subject themselves to redlining and black codes and all of this. My grandfather, I can, I can tell you a story about my grandfather where my grandfather was in his 50s, Pullman Porter, all right, for 40 years or so. No, he wasn't at that time. He was a Pullman Porter. But he's in, I believe he was in Mississippi or Tennessee with my dad, and the car broke down. He went to try to get some gas. And, you know, this is somebody, you know, my grandfather's 50, and the, the guy told him, uh, you need to go up the street, boy. We don't serve gas to niggas around here. So, you know, he, now he's got to walk three, four more miles just to get gas in, you know, you in Tennessee and Mississippi in the summertime, you know how, to, how hot that could be carrying a gas can and then having to carry a full gas can back, all right, to try to, you know, fill up your car. And so these types of people, people that had to drink out of, you know, water fountains, it was, you know, you don't know where that water came from. And so these are people that are old reparations. People talking about my reparations for me. No. Okay, I'm pretty sure we've, 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 many of us have suffered some discrimination. I know I have, but I have not suffered anything close to my ancestors during um, slavery or during Jim Crow segregation. So what would that be for me or for us, all right, in the modern times? Reparations we would be getting, would be speaking, would be for our ancestors that suffered, all right? And when you talk about civil rights violations and, and constitutional rights violations, now you start to go into families. Um, you can punish these states all right, for letting atrocities happen or passing these laws that were unconstitutional, and we can make some form of reparation, general reparation for that, all right? But when it comes to us, what we would be doing is inheriting the legacy, all right, of the reparations given to our ancestors. So let's not call it reparations. Let's start calling it our inheritance for the reparations for our ancestors that suffered in this nation. So with that being said, okay, right now when it comes to that, we're not prepared. To, like I said, if, 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 if the United States were to cut a check, okay, I've seen somewhere somebody, I've just seen a news, um, some, um, well, they've calculated that Every black person is supposed to get $1.5 million, okay? That's not going to happen, all right? Why won't that happen? Economically, the United States would be printing money, flooding the, flooding the, the system, flooding the, the monetary system with worthless dollars. And right now, our, um, our um, inflation is at 1.9%. You're probably looking at, inflation jumping up to about 25%. So your dollars would be worth less, okay? That would ruin the country. America's not going to do that, all right? They're not, they're not going to just, just start breaking checks off. Not like that, okay? So ruining the country, causing inflation to be like that, causing the dollar to drop, not just in America, but to drop around the world, okay? That also is national security. I mean, we got to be real about it, okay? So issues of national security, when you start talking about the monetary system of a country, you know, 14 trillion, 60 trillion, 20 trillion, you know. So like I said, it won't happen like that. But before we even get to that point, all right, like, like you're saying, is you got these candidates talking about doing studies and things, and that, that's a necessary component. Here's the thing. If we're going to do a study, we need to take control of the study. I'm hearing people who... Are, are doing studies for us who have no stake in this game, no skin in this game, who don't, that are not descendants of American slaves, who have not suffered, who have not had their ancestors, or have stories about ancestors suffering and have enslaved ancestors, okay, talking about doing studies for us. Nah. See, so, so, so if, if, if anything is going to happen, we've got to be a part of that think tank and a part of that process to figure out because if we don't figure it out, and that's what you have happening, right, is right now they're just, just patronizing and placating us with, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll do a study and we'll, we'll start seriously talking about it and we'll, we'll put it together. And like I said, is that HR 40. HR 40 was actually introduced in 1989. 
That's John Kynes and um, Dr. Claude. As a matter of fact, um, there's a video out there with, with, with Dr. Claude Anderson and John Kynes and the Congressional Black Caucus trying to come up with a formula and a strategy on how to get reparations for it. So this is like, like, like you said, Scotty, this is not something that's brand new. Okay, this is the, you know, you start hearing that this is the latest conversation, but it's not new. So we have to be wary of, you know, false promises and what these people are saying. Oh, yeah, we're going to, and like I said, if, if, if we're not controlling the narrative on that, you'll get what somebody's going to give you, and then you'll be pissed off. All right, well, so. Right, why right. Would, just know, just to stress again. Off, get involved with it. <laughs> yeah, but again, got to have to seat at the table as Michon was yeah, alluding to. So if Julian yeah. Castro is talking about if he's president and he's going to be on a task for he's going to start a task force to study it, then, you yeah. know, does that does that involve the uh, uh, American, excuse me, American Slaves Political Action Committee? You know? Yeah. So who are they talking to? For yeah. example, I guess a supporter or a staff member, uh, I don't know her name. She doesn't have a lot of name recognition, but she got some for saying that she ha- supports res- reparations. And you go to the information that was shared with me. I go to her website, and she's talking about FDR doing stuff to help people. And I was like, yeah, but he discriminated against uh, black folks. Um, by not allowing them to be take part in the New Deal. See, that's part of that harm you was talking about. You know, and people want to look at FDR like he was a progressive. Yeah, he was progressive for white people, but not for the victims of slavery who needed needed repair. But that also, that time period, you know, the New Deal was introduced because of what? Coming out the Great Depression. And so that ties into when you was talking about they not getting ready to flood the um, uh, uh, monetary system with American dollars to cause what? Another uh, another uh, depression? You know, uh, this system almost collapsed from just the shady dealings of a few bankers. You know, in, in the... Think about it like this. Think about it like this. If America's a corporation, the corporations are first and foremost uh, loyal to their shareholders. Right. Okay? If the dollar system is devalued. So all of your stocks and all of your shares are now devalued. So right. all of the money that you thought you was going to have because you've got all of these stocks and investment, all of this stuff tied up, not just liquid assets, but tied up assets with millions and millions of dollars or whatever. Now all of a sudden that just shrinks, okay, by millions of dollars. And do you think that, you know, being that, like I said, this is a corporation, all right, a corporate company, a corporate country, do you think actually that America is going to shrink, all right, the money for the stock. And you, CEOs and presidents of companies get fired. Matter of fact, the president of Ford got fired because the stock started to tank so bad, and they had to get somebody in to get the stock back up. See, so that's what you have to look at it from that type of an angle, mm-hmm. saying, okay, when this deflate, when this it, 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 inflation hits like that, it's not just going to affect the price of the thing, it's going to affect your stock value. Okay, right, and, and right. ain't no way in the world that's gonna happen. Yeah, and then, uh, but the other thing, you know, see that the table now. I don't know this woman's name, um, but she said fifty million dollars. I mean, excuse me, fifty billion dollars. And so, my question to her staffer or supporter or whatever: How did you arrive at that figure? So that's like what you studied this for us. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Where did you get this study from exactly. and come up? And then exactly. you're talking about creating a commission, I guess, to distribute the $500 billion. Well, who's going to be on that? You know, so, yeah, these people aren't being serious. No, no, they're not. Matter of fact, um, $1.25 trillion, $1.3 trillion of black income that we get, we keep about 66 to 70 billion dollars of that. The rest of it goes into the dominant white society. So if you break off another five hundred billion dollars, all right, to black folks that only keep, you know, two cents, five cents out of every dollar, where do you think that money's gonna go? That's gonna go right back into the dominant white society once again. See so and then once that happens and our conditions don't change, then we can't call for reparations no more. Because they'll be like, well, wait a minute, we just gave y'all reparations. There is no more reparations to get. You'll get shut down. That's, this is what I'm saying. So 
that type of conversation, I'm not against reparations. I'm, I'm for intelligent compensation for our ancestors, our inheritance, okay? Well, let's because talk about real life. quick, Mr. Walker. Let's talk real quick about what are some of the things in that list of demands. Now, we talked about um, um, for the descendants of American slaves, uh, tax exemption. I mean, that's a tangible yeah, yeah. benefit. Um, you also yeah, talked okay. about what, you know, people go into the military. I was in the military. You was in the military. Michonne was in the military. Therefore, we qualify with that legal status of a of, of veteran, a U.S. military veteran, for guaranteed home loan, guaranteed business loan, well, you talked about some of those things with me privately on the phone about guaranteed, you know, those things for the descendants of American uh, slaveries as part of, you know, what was owed to the ancestors and to repair, you know, their lineage. Yep. So, so let's, so, so, you know, first thing we have to do, all right, like you said, is, is, is decide who qualifies for it and how they qualify. Then you have to say, oh, well, who's going to pay for it? Well, who's going to pay for it is the United States, okay? Because this is not something a lot of people think reparations is a is a is a, is a case of morality or benevolence, and that's not what it's about. It's about a case of law. We would be suing the United States of America, and that that's you know. So it ain't about if they give us or you know. No, no, we're not talking. We're talking about suing the nation. All right, like Dr. King's family did for the wrongful death of Dr. King. So people that don't think the nation can be sued. The nation can be sued or suing states, right? So, what would be some type of form of conversation? Um, whatever numbers can come up with, I've seen numbers as high as sixty trillion dollars, all right, based upon the labor and pain and suffering and all of that, all right. Whatever that number is, then you look at every American descendant of slaves, all right, being completely, totally tax exempt of every single tax. I'm talking. Luxury tax, sales tax, uh, vehicle tax, homeowner tax, every tax, okay, the state tax, federal tax, every tax. Why is that a good idea? Because typically for, you know, working class, middle class black people, or even poor black people, all right, that are working, okay, we pay anywhere from just with income tax, state and federal income tax, anywhere from 21 to 35 percent in taxes. Plus, with your sales tax on top of that, um, you know, so you're looking at anywhere from 40 to 50 percent in taxes with, you know, homeowners, if you own a home or if you have a car, or, you know, all of these. So you're paying, if we, so imagine whatever you make, okay, if you make $60,000, if you make, you know, $45,000, you make, you know, whatever you make. Let's say, let's, 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 let's use a number like 48, no, I'll tell you what. Let's use a number like $60,000. If you make $60,000, okay, you know, typically you're only going to get about $40,000, right? Well, imagine being able to get all $60,000, okay? So what does that translate to? That's $5,000 a month, okay? Is what that, instead of getting, you know, whatever, instead of getting like $3,500 or whatever, you're getting an extra $1,500 a month or so. That right there, you know, now this is where, this is where, financial literacy comes in, instead of, you know, okay, well, I'm already doing well with what I have, I don't, now I'm getting more, so I'm going to spend more. No, you don't spend more. You, like, you take that money and you save and invest it. Because now what people could do is, you know, one of the things we suffer from, we got a lot of, a lot of black folks with good ideas, good skills. I was talking to a sister in that um, um, not too long ago. I'm looking at her food on Facebook. I'm like, so we need to put some money together to, 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 to get you a restaurant because your stuff is looking good. Well, the problem we suffer from is we don't have venture capital, all right, in order to, to, to fund some of these ideas. Well, by doing this, okay, now within our community, we have the funding. We, you know, all invest to put our money together to build this and be a part of that. Now we have the money to be able, plus, we have the money to do it plus we can still maintain our lifestyle and not be suffering, all right, trying to come up with the money to try to do some things. Um, $250,000 business grant, not a business loan. You have a good business plan, 
about starting a business and starting to try to, you know, you want to start a business. So I misunderstood you on that. I'm, I'm sorry, I misunderstood you on that. I may have misspoke earlier or, you know, I got the wrong understanding from our conversations because I was under the assumption that it was a loan because I used the example of veterans' oh, home loan or veterans' oh, business no, loan. No, no, no. no, you're saying grant, yes, and that's a big a difference. Grant, exactly. That's a big difference. And the reason why is because for 246, 246 years in this country, our people were denied the ability to make, matter of fact, they had to create an act. The, the 1866 Civil Rights Act in order for our people, former slaves who are now citizens of the United States, to make money. They have to create an act so that we could now make money. So, uh, no, 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 no. Let's talk about a, a business grant. Okay, so, and now you, not anybody can just go get a business grant. You can't just show up and be like, okay, I need my 250000 for my business grant. Like I say, you have to show a legitimate business plan People who are serious about business and understand, you know, those people who really, you know, are trying to get into business and understand it. See, so, so how do we, you know, learn how to create business plans or, be, you know, or, or become entrepreneurs? Well, here's the other thing is we get free education, all right? I'm talking scholarships, okay, and scholarships for those who qualify, all right? You can't be getting, have a 1.5 GPA and think you're just going to get into Harvard or Georgetown or or Yale, okay, you know, you, great, you know, your grades, your, your grades got to be up, you have to qualify to be able to get, you know, scholarship. Now, you can get a scholarship to the community college, all right, you know, or, or, or the junior college, you know. Well, Mr. But, Walker, though, I have to say, though, I hope in, let's say, three, four years that co- free college tuition Still got to pay for your books and to get the, you know, your other, but free college tuition at state universities and colleges, which is already getting public funds. But, you know, I'm hoping that, I, hey, I'm down for, I, I'm not going to say, hey, I only want it for my group because, you know, they pushing what they pushing and they can, if they, that's one of those lift all boats policies that will benefit us. But let's say that don't happen. Yeah. That's when you put this on the table. Well, then I want free college tuition for, you know, and then, like you said, you know, they have to also academically uh, 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 be eligible to get into that college. You just can't go to Harvard because, cause you know, I'm a legacy or whatever, um, you know. So so please continue. I just wanted to clarify that point. I do want yep. uh, um, that what Sanders and now some others are saying. Uh, I do want that to happen for all because it'll benefit us. But if it don't happen, then this should be included on the table for descendants of American slaves. Well, also along with college, okay, is, is the thing you got now, you know, here's the catch-22. Okay, so you can get in these colleges if you do well, all right, or if you, um, if you, if, if, if your grades are high enough. Well, we have to stick to public education, basic education as well. All right, for our communities. You look at Detroit, I think, what was it? I forget how many years ago, they had something like a 25% high school graduation rate. Okay, the schools are falling apart. You know, here, you know, Detroit, Baltimore, some of these bigger cities where the education is, is really bad. These kids can't go to college, all right? Okay, qualify for that because they don't make the grade, all right? So you've got to fix that part of it as well, okay, to where our children are are able to, to get the right proper education, not no cookie cutter socialized education, but intellectualized education where these kids can say, okay, you have the skill to be able to go to college. I, I, my son, okay, graduated. I've seen so many of our young men who were not dumb kids. These were intelligent young men, but they were not ready to go to college because of our culture. Um, they got good grades. All right, but when you go, that next step to college, okay, is, is, is about discipline as well, okay? Our kids, you know, often don't, okay, don't have that kind of discipline, all right, to be on their own, to be able to study, do all this, and manage all this. So these are things that we have to teach our children, um, you know, culturally to be ready for. Right, so right. Like I said, when, when that time comes, hey, 
free college because we were denied education. All right, education. Free college, uh, not free tuition, school. but free college. That means free scholarships. You don't get to go to college only because you can play basketball and make me billions. Of dollars. I heard Duke right. University tickets, man, was. Were they making like a billion dollars off of Duke tickets? I, you know, they may have been exaggerating in that story, but on, not on, on uh, our gifted athletes should not be the only ones that's giving full rides. I, I hear what you're look saying. Here, look at My son was saying the Duke Carolina game, the tickets was $1,500. Wow. That's a college game, folks. Yeah. That's a college this game. A college game. College game where ain't none of these kids getting paid. Exactly. Mr. Uh, Walker, though, we got like five minutes. We got like five minutes, and there is something, you know, that um, some that I would uh, like you um, to address. Man, my thought on what I wanted you to address uh, escaped me there for a second, but we're going to ha- have you back um, for a series of conversations, maybe, you know, once every two weeks or once a month, um, something pop up, something happen. Of course, we can get you on and uh, get that in- information uh, out. But, you know, um, what I wanted you to talk about, though, is, again, people are sensitive when you start talking truth. And the fact is, I've noted xenophobia in some of them other movements. We ain't got to talk to say no names. But where they are alienating African people who may be African immigrants over here on a student visa or something like that. Or coming over here to work. They didn't graduated medical school in Nigeria. Now they over here, you know, uh, in the black community working as doctors. Or, um, you know, other Caribbean you know, descendants of, uh, of of slaves in that particular area. And, you know, the ones that I've talked to, they called into my show the last time I, I covered that topic. They said they understand that, that what we're, when we're talking about quote unquote reparations, that we ain't talking about them. But like I had mentioned to you earlier, um, especially people like Ross, or if they have completed the immigration process and now are U.S. citizens, they are, can still be part of that voting block to push it. And many of them are married to the descendants of American slaves like Ross's case. So, you know, that's still, I just would like you to speak to, do you, is it necessary in your opinion to alienate uh, possible members of, of the voting block of the political action committee? No, it's not. And, and I'm going to tell you why. Yes, we, we want to be pro descendants of American slaves, all right, or American descendants of slaves, pro. But here's the truth of the matter is, the truth of the matter is everybody in the Western Hemisphere is a descendant of slaves. Now, maybe not American slaves, they're descendants of slaves and slavery, all right? Every, every person of African descent, all right, in the Western Hemisphere is a descendant of slavery, okay? People who are from Africa are descendants or even survivors of colonization and colonialism. And imperialism, all right? Our people have suffered. In America, we live in the same communities. You don't have, well, you know, the, these are Africans and Jamaicans. You got the Jamaican people across the next door, the, the African people up the street. So we all live in the same community, and things that happen within our community affect us all. They can benefit us all, and they can hurt us all, because we're all in the same community. Therefore, when it comes to the political action committee, we're not, you know, we're not uh, discriminating. We're not, oh, well, you can only be uh, have slave ancestry, slavery. No, 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 no. If you live in our community, I don't care if you're a white person. You live in our community, we want you because we want those dollars, we want those votes, because this is how we organize to be able to take care of the things that we got to take care of. I'm not against anybody making their money, plain and simple, whoever you are. I, you know, we got to be for our people making our money. All right, now. Being for us making our money does not mean we have to bash others, okay, or, or talk about others, be against others. Because what happens is that's like, um, that's like the child that um, is complaining to the parent, well, you giving that one this, but you're not giving me this, okay? No, 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 no. We, we're not trying to go down that route. What we're trying to do is be about, hey, we want to be able to help ourselves, okay, and have the ability like other people. This is what... Immigrants do. Immigrants come here, they have a plan, they make sacrifices, they put their pennies and dollars and money together, and then they go off and create businesses and make 
is live the American dream. We want access to that too. But that does not mean that, okay, well, we want you to take this away from them to give to us, all right, or we, you know, we're jealous of these people. No, no, no. That's, uh-uh. We're focused on us, but at the same time, understand that there has to be some connections. Ultimately, ultimately, all right, when all of this works out, okay, ultimately, the world has gone global, and we've got to make alliances all right, globally with Africans, with people in the Caribbean, all right, with South Americans, all right, just like Marcus Garvey, you know, what he did, because he understood 100 years ago the, the, the value of a global group of people operating in a global economy, all right. We can't come to the table, all right, if we're not prepared to sit in that seat, and that's what it is we got to do. We got to come up and raise up and get ourselves prepared so when we make these global alliances and partnerships, it can benefit everybody, you know. It can benefit all the entire African diaspora because I am not anti-Pan-Africanist. I'm not xenophobic. I'm, you know, I'm not looking down my nose, oh, well, that's an immigrant. They ain't nothing like me. Uh-uh. But these people, like I said, if, if, if you had an African, a Jamaican, uh, a Kenyan, a Jamaican, uh, a descendant of American slaves, a South African, a, a, a Brazilian and a Colombian and all of them were African descent and they was all in the car got pulled over by some racist cops they would all be niggas alright we'd all be in the same boat so so that's that's where I'm at with that and I'm not trying to you know diss it right now but at, at the same time we still are about trying to get ourselves okay in a position where right, we can right. join these R- other right. people see, so. well, well what I'm saying though there is um Power in the vote, power in the money, and they can contribute to the goals of the the uh, descendants of American slaves by becoming members of this political action committee. You know, it's up front what the intent is and, and who is seeking specific benefits for. But again, all of the immigrant intermarriages with American descendants of slaves, like in Ross's case, he's from Tobago, but his his wife is a descendant of American slave and therefore their children are. So he definitely is yeah. on board for anything that's going to benefit his family. Yeah, almost definitely. So Absolutely. why alienate I, that, I, that, 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 that exactly. person that can I, help I you? Yeah, I'm, I'm not funny. I mean, it's, it's like I said, it's, 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 okay, so he's from, from Tobago, all right, and his wife is American descendant of slaves. Guess what? He's a descendant of slaves as well because he didn't get to Tobago, his, his ancestors didn't just get to Tobago because they was naturally there, right? Right. So, right. You know, so, so like I said, is it, 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 how could you have a problem with that? I don't, that you know, you talk about one person, or one situation, you know, African diaspora and relationships and marriages that happens that strengthens us as a whole because it, you know it exposes us to other cultures to where when we get ready to make these business connections. We already know how to speak the language. You know the customs. You know the culture, and we have friendships and bonds. We know the land. And, and, yeah, we know the land. Yeah, we know exactly. we got context. So we got to get to that point, though. So what we're talking about first things first, though. You know, got to get who is an American uh, uh, descendant of slaves? Who who is that person? How do we get legislation to legally define that? Because if y'all stated I, again, I use I refer to myself as a black man, culturally part of a global black family. But when we're talking about uh, political benefits coming from the U.S. government, then yes, I'm a descendant of a, a American slave. You know what I'm saying? So so you know, definitely we got to continue this conversation. Uh, so glad to speak with you, you know, during the week and glad that you could devote this past two hours to our listening audience. And, and of course, you know, we're going to have to get Mr. Mr. Shelton on, you know, because like you said, he created it. So uh, any final we can, comments? Yeah, we can, we, yes. We, um, um, for those who are interested, um, please come and join our Facebook page. Um, that is DAS Movement, Descendants of American Slaves Movement. You know, that's, that's our Facebook page. Also, anybody that is interested in joining the uh, DOS Pack, like I said, is what we've done is, is we've made a price point of $5 a month. $5 a month is one less pack of cigarettes, 
uh, one less um, 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 fast food meal, you know, five dollars of stuff that most people won't miss, and it goes a long way, especially when we get a lot of people. Because in order to organize, we got to have offices, we got to have researchers, we have to hire people, we have to employ people, and that takes money. So, like I said, is, is anybody interested? Our um, website to donate to our organization is das d a s network dot org. And like I said, we're developing. We got more to come. We're going to have newsletters, websites, all of this, all of this kind of stuff is is in the works right now. All right, because like I said, we're a new organization, and um, we we got to make a change. All right, see, so anybody that's willing to make a change, you're not asking for a whole lot of time or even a whole lot of money, but every little bit helps. And and that's where we got to be is where you know a little bit, a little bit goes a long way. And when we start to get those victories, all right. That, that you know we're trying to achieve, that just makes us more motivated, and that grows the movement, and we can actually we can actually change things. One of the things I say is that Superman is not coming to save us, so we better stop looking for him. We are going to have to save ourselves. That means we got to fund our own revolution, and we got to be the ones that get involved. And this is this this is it. This is the time to get involved. And with that, Scotty, I appreciate being here. All right, Mr. Walker. Uh, again, the website, if I uh, say that one more time, the Facebook page and the website. Facebook page is, 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 um, is, is Descendants of American Slaves Movement. Descendants of American Slaves Movement. And the website where and they donate. DAS Network. All of that is one word, dasnetwork.org. You don't have to put www, just dasnetwork.org. All like right. All it is is $5. Five dollars a month, I'm not trying to hustle nobody. I ain't about ego. We, we, we got to get this thing done. All right. Well, thank you again for spending your time with us. Listen, audience, we're going to call it a night and end this live broadcast of Black Talk Radio News. Again, I'll be back on air tomorrow night, Friday night, 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. David uh, Wren of Tando Radio Show, also a prosperity mint. Uh, We're going to continue as the CNN contributor called it, the reparations talk. Um, and to just give you an idea of how unrealistic it is, as Mr. Walker talk about, if you think the United States about to cut a check. But if they did, what would you do with it? So it's about that financial literacy portion of it. Hope that you are able to join us. Please, if you think that the information shared is valuable, uh, share it with others, uh, people through the social networks uh, that we uh, distribute the content to, we have to share tools and what have you. And please continue to support the North Carolina-based nonprofit Black Talk Media Project, which uh, founded and uh, maintains BlackTalkRadioNetwork.com. With that said, recognize the fact we live behind the enemy lines of USA, Inc. They still practice and legalize slavery via the 13th Amendment of the United States Constitution that needs to be repealed. The amendment needs to be appeal- repealed and replaced with an amendment that has no exceptions for slavery. With that said, peace and blessings to all. Scott Stewart. Scott Stewart.